Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Along with my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's event, Pet Safety in the City with Dr. Carly Fox. This webinar is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you have questions or concerns about your pet's health, it is always best to consult your veterinarian. I'd like to take a moment to highlight two upcoming webinars. On Thursday, June 20th at 6 p.m., Dr. Jonathan Ferrari will join us to discuss mast cell tumors in dogs and cats. And then on Wednesday, July 17th at 6 p.m., Dr. Dennis Slade will lead a webinar on Cushing's disease in dogs and cats. You can find more information and register for these events on our website at amcny.org slash events um, and in tonight's newsletter. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carly Fox. She earned her undergraduate degree from Cornell University and attended veterinary school at, at Ross University and Cornell University, graduating in 2009, following a rotating medicine and surgery internship at the Animal Medical Center in 2010. Dr. Fox joins our emergency and critical care department full-time Working in one of the busiest veterinary ERs in the world, Dr. Fox brings a wealth of experience and knowledge to tonight's event. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carly Fox. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to speak to you tonight about um, some things we deal with um, living in an urban environment with our pets. Let me just get this going. Okay. What you see is a my PowerPoint slide. Looks good, yeah. Okay, amazing. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, hold on, I need to minimize this. Okay, so, um, you know, I live in New York, big New Yorker over here. Um, in New York, over 50% of New York City households have pets, that's a whole lot. Manhattan actually has the largest uh, population of dogs in the five boroughs, and there's over 600,000 dogs and over 500,000 cats in New York City. And some interesting facts that I liked, 55% uh, of owners spend more on their pets grooming than on their own. So we love, love, love our pets. I don't, but a lot of people do. Um, six out of 10 New Yorkers have bought outfits for their pets. They really just love their pets and they're part of, of their family. And I'm sure that's how you guys feel about all of your pets at home. The most uh, popular dog in New York City is the French Bulldog, followed by a bunch of Doodle Poodle varieties, which I'm sure you've seen, and Goldens. So today I'm going to talk about all the unique safety issues our pets face living in an urban environment. And I highlighted um, a couple of them that I thought were very important. This includes high-rise syndrome, hit-by-car bike, uh, dog at park etiquette, which we'll talk about, elevator and escalator injury, marijuana ingestion, leptospirosis, pavement injury, rodenticide inge ingestion, and blue-green algae. I have a lot to talk about. So we're going to start with high-rise syndrome. So what is high-rise syndrome? Maybe it's something that you guys have heard of. It is defined as a fall from a height of two or more stories that results in a very uh, common constellation of injuries in small animals. So when I see an animal with all of these injuries, sometimes people don't know what trauma actually happened to their animal. But when I see the animal and I look at them and, and evaluate them and see all of these things, I can basically tell you that they fell from a height. And it's really common in New York because there are all these very big buildings. Um, so what are the things that I see in these animals commonly? I see a lot of head trauma or traumatic brain injury, oral and facial trauma, uh, meaning that their palate can be fractured. So the roof of their mouth is fractured. It's a really common classic sign in uh, animals that fall from height, especially cats. Epistaxis, which is bleeding from the nose, mandibular fractures and dental avulsions. They get thoracic trauma, such as pneumothorax, when air escapes from uh, inside the lungs to outside into the thoracic cavity, pulmonary contusions or bruising of the, of the lungs, and then rib fractures, abdominal trauma, which um, we often see will splenic or hepatic fracture. So their spleen or their liver, which are very vascular organs can break and then they can bleed into their abdomen as well as urinary rupture or um, rarely traumatic pancreatitis. It's something that um, we can see as well. 
In addition, pelvic and limb fractures, very, very common. Typically, this is something that we see most commonly in cats, much more in dogs, and um, we typically see it in young animals. So we see it in animals of, of all different ages, but really more commonly in young, like curious animals that don't understand that they're in a high rise in a building. They don't understand that if they jump out of a window, there's not, you know, nothing outside. In a study of 119 cats, 60% uh, were less than one years old. Um, and this is something we see much more commonly in warmer months. So spring is a perfect time where we actually see a spike in high rise syndrome because people are opening their windows and starting to get nice out. And, um, you know, we see these cases much more commonly now. However, being that we live in New York City or I live in New York City, um, it's something we can see at any time of year. And in New York, if you know that um, a lot of buildings will have their heat just blasting in the winter and the only way to control it a lot of the times is to open your window because a lot of apartment apartments don't have individual control of the heat so we can see this in winter when people open up their window to try to just get some sort of temperature control in their apartment um, but again it's more common this time of year roaming and mating behavior may contribute so animals that are intact and not spayed or neutered um, will want to go and roam and leave their home in order to try to find a mate. There's no uh, sex or breed predilection. So female, male, any breed of cat um, is can have this happen to them. What is good about these cases, although all of those injuries that I described sound sort of terrible, um, with care, these animals actually can do super, super well. So um, they have a survival rate of over 90% with care. That means that if your animal falls out of a, a window, don't just bring it inside and expect it to get better because I'm saying that most of these cases get better. I'm saying with care. So with care at typically a, a specialty hospital because this is a very specific disease and we like to deal with trauma more than your general practitioner down the street. Um, this is something, again, we see more commonly in, in cats, but we can see it in other animals as well. I've seen several dog high rises um, throughout my career. And because dogs are not cats, they experience worse, worse injury. Um, and it has a lot to do with the weight of a dog is typically more than a cat. They um, don't have a writing reflex like a cat. So that old adage where cats, you know, fall on their feet, that's actually sort of true. They have the ability to land um, on their feet due to a bunch of um, att attributes just secondary to being a cat. They're, cats are uh, animals that are from trees, you know, back in the day. So they're actually used to evolutionary falling and landing on their feet. And because of that, their injuries um, are very specific, whereas dogs don't have that ability. And when they fall, they fall sort of crazy. And because of that, um, they can develop worse injuries than cats do. So they often will develop thoracic trauma if they fall more than three stories, less facial and head trauma, perhaps because when they fall, their limbs absorb more of the impact. Um, and these cases typically require surgical stabilization, which often leads to a longer hospitalization. However, the prognosis with these cases, even though their um, injuries are worse, is still very favor favorable. They can still do quite well. Um, I also want to mention rabbits. People have rabbits in New York City, and um, they can also experience high-rise syndrome. I think a lot of people will put their rabbits next to a window to see outside or have their rabbits on a balcony, um, and they can fall uh, just like any other animals can. They're very fast. They like to jump, um, and they, they can fall as well, and I've seen a rabbit high-rise um, a couple in my day as well. Also, rabbits are tiny, so if you put them on a surface that is high up, they can fall off of a counter or a table and experience um, pretty significant injury. Rabbits, when they fall from a height, um, their prognosis is worse. They're much more fragile than dogs and cats. So just something to keep in mind if you're a rabbit owner. What's, I think, the most important thing to take away from this is that this is an avoidable problem. Um, it is a preventable accident. It is usually an accident. And when people come in, they feel very, um, you know, sad and guilty because it is something that is avoidable in most cases. So 
you know, close your windows. That seems very obvious, but if you do open them, make sure to have very well-fitting screens or bars. If you have child locks on your windows, that's a good way to let air in and not allow enough space for your cat to, to climb outside. Don't allow your cat um, or dog on a balcony. And I think um, being in New York, a lot of people I speak to are like, I love to sit on the balcony with my cat or um, my dog. And I, I just, I worry for these animals on the balcony, although that sounds very nice. Um, you know, they should be somehow uh, confined and, you know, on a leash and make sure that they're not able to actually go over the balcony because I've seen several high rise cases where that is what happens. And then of course, um, just to add to the reasons why to spay and neuter your animal, but um, this is one another reason to spay and neuter to avoid roaming behavior. Okay, we're gonna talk now about hit by car or hit by bike which is something that we see very commonly in New York. Um, a lot of the injuries are very similar to cats that fall out of a window. So just see what's called polytrauma. Dogs are more commonly hit by moving vehicles than cats, although both species are at risk. Injuries range from mild to severe and in can include road rash or skin lacerations, orthopedic injury, um, traumatic brain injury, thoracic injury like the lung bruising and a pneumothorax, and intra-abdominal injury like um, like fracture of the, the spleener liver, like I mentioned before. Animals that present with um, traumatic brain injury or hypothermia, which is a low body temperature and hyperglycemia, which is a high blood sugar, have worse prognosis. Um, the average time these animals are in the hospital is about two days, not terrible. And they have about an 85% survival rate, which is again, quite high. With care, these animals can do quite well. Dogs with orthopedic injury are typically in the hospital longer because they often re require sur uh, surgical stabilization. Um, I'm gonna take this time also to just mention cats since they also can be hit by cars uh, in the city. And I think that either they get out of your apartment and they inadvertently get hit by a car or people um, now have been, I think, tending to walk their cat more on leashes. And I just wanna make a note about that. Um, you know, cats don't naturally wanna walk on a leash like a dog does and they require tons and tons of training um, before I think taking your cat outside. If you're planning on walking your cat on a leash, make sure to really practice and to train them. And that means starting in the home um, in a confined area and don't just like bring them outside on the street on, in a harness because that will probably not go very well. So you, it requires a lot of time and care. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, um, but I think you need to just build up to it and understand what goes into safely walking your cat on a leash outside. You also wanna make sure their harness really fits them. Um, cats are very agile and bendy um, and fast. So they can get out of their harnesses more easier than dogs can. Um, and I think just like double leashing them, like a leash on their collar, a leash on their harness is just an extra precaution to take really in both animals, but mostly in, in cats to prevent that from happening. So um, again, prevention is, is key if we can. Don't allow your, your dog to um, walk in or use the bike lane a lot. My dog used to just like, like to go to the bathroom in the bike lane if you can prevent that from happening. Um, that is ideal because these bikes, if you live in New York or any major city, you see them zooming down the bike lanes. Um, and I, they really, a lot of the times aren't paying attention to a dog that can just like jump in, in their way. Um, and I see several dogs get, get hit by bikes in New York and they can have pretty significant injuries as well, similar to when they get hit by a car. You always want to keep your pet on a leash. Um, I think another note here is that most places eventually, you know, you see a person with their dog and their dog is not on a leash. Their dog is walking behind them or in front of them or near them. And typically when you talk to those owners, they feel very strongly that their dog it would never get hit by a car, would never uh, do this, would never, uh, you know, go up to a child or, uh, you know, try to attack another dog, et cetera. And I like to believe that that is true, but I, I will never actually believe you. I, I feel like those are the dogs that are more likely to get hit by a car, more likely to get into an altercation with another dog or to scare a person who's not as comfortable with dogs as perhaps we are. So um, I don't believe that your animal is perfectly trained and we have leash laws for a reason and you should follow them to prevent injuries um, 
in general, and especially when animals get hit by a car. Uh, you don't want to use retractable leashes. You want to use fixed length leashes. You want to just have more control over your animal um, at all times. And you want to make sure your harness or collar fits. Loose harnesses and collars lead to many, many accidents and deaths. I can't tell you how many people come in with their animal that just got hit by a car and they're in one hand, they're holding their animal that is very sick. And the other hand, they're holding their leash attached to a harness that slipped off of their animal. So make sure that it fits and that um, if you aren't sure, you can have you know someone check you at, at, at the veterinary at your local vet's office. Um, you can also, again, put a leash on their collar and a leash on their harness to prevent them from slipping off. Also in New York, we have um, a great benefit of Central Park. They allow off-leash hours in the mornings um, and you wanna make sure that when you get there with your dog, not to just like get through the gates of Central Park and then allow them to just run in. I typically recommend that people walk further into the park and let them off leash there because that's when animals get spooked sometimes, turn around and go the other way right towards the road and can get hit by a car then. You want to make sure your pet is microchipped. Um, this is old, you know, old news, but I can't tell you how many animals come in without their owners brought in by a good Samaritan after they realize that the dog or, or cat is injured. And the first thing that we do in the emergency room, aside from you know, addressing their injuries obviously is to microchip them and to see if they are an owned pet. And then spaying and neutering, like I talked about before, um, prevents roaming behavior. And then of course you wanna make sure that your, your dog has basic training and commands like sit, stay, no, all of the, drop it, all of these things um, that really seems, you know, in the beginning, it's annoying when they're puppies to do it, but doing it really prevents so much as they get older and, and really helps um, prevent injury and prevent accidents and um, is, is just every, to everyone's benefit. Okay, um, elevator, escalator, and uh, revolving door injury, also a very urban problem. So, um, Escalator injury, we're going to talk about first. Entrapment typically occurs in two locations most commonly on the escalator itself. This happens between moving steps and the sidewall. So where that like bristle is on the sidewall and then between the moving steps and the comb plate. So that's the metal at the end of the escalator when you get off of the escalator. Your dogs do not know what an escalator is. They don't understand how it works or what, what's going to happen. The, the stairs are going to disappear and then they're going to have to step off. They do not understand what an escalator is. Please know that. <laughs> Guide dogs who receive actual escalator training still sometimes get injuries with the escalator. So in a study, three service dogs actually presented um, with, in, with injuries related to the escalator to a, a specialty hospital. And even those are the dogs that actually get like training. Whereas your, you know, regular dog who's not a service dog has no escalator training. So um I I can't stress enough how again preventable this is, but also um how very serious it is um in these patients. And most injuries actually occur for some reason in small dogs. I don't know why. People like their small dogs to be riding an elevator. They think it's an escalator. They think it's cute. They put it down. Um, these are the dogs that come in with like terrible, terrible injuries. I know these pictures are sort of um, hard to look at, but these are actually what they come in and, and look like when they come to the ER. Um, a study in JVAC, which is a, a veterinary journal, showed that entrapment um, can happen in the front or hind paws, but mostly we're in the hind. So your animal knows to like step off, but then they don't know that their back legs also need to, to step off. Injuries include paw pad or skin lacerations, paw pad or digit avulsions. That's when the paw pad or toe actually like comes off of the body um, and fractures to the digits. 50% of these cases require surgical treatment, um, which includes whole or partial digit amputation, so actually removing of their toes, uh, wound debridement, and, and primary closure, which includes suturing. The other 50% requires clipping and cleaning and bandage placement. Um, and even those cases that only require bandage placement require so much care because often they are need bandage replacements um, and monitoring of the wounds every couple of days through the emergency room or through their primary care vet to make sure that everything is healing well. So 
Although that sounds better, it's sometimes it's it's just as 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 bad for the dog. How do we avoid this? Again, another avoidable problem. Um, your dog should avoid escalators at all times. It's not that cute. You don't need to have them riding next to you on the escalator. Like that Instagram picture is not worth it. If your dog is small, pick it up um, and hold it in your hands or put it in a bag. If you have a larger dog, use the stairs or use the elevator. Um, that's a good lead into my next topic, which is elevator injury. The elevator is safer than an escalator, but um, it is something that can still result in injury in New York, in most urban environments. There's tons and tons of elevators. I think most of our dogs are pretty used to taking the elevator downstairs to go for a walk. Um, crush injuries are most common in these patients. It often involves the hind or back end of pets, including the tail. Treatment's very variable with these cases, but um, a lot of cases will actually require some sort of intervention, either medical, surgical, or both. Sometimes we have to amputate um, an animal's tail, or they can um, get fractures or have very significant um, soft tissue injury. Also, leash entrapment, um, and this can really be fatal uh, due to strangulation or a massive crush injury. I'm going to play this um, video. For you guys. Oh, the elevator. Sorry for this. Um, let me just show you what this could look like. And I, I, I know this is also sometimes a little hard to watch, but it really just shows you what could happen to your dog if the leash gets caught in the elevator and the elevator starts moving. So you can see that these dogs get caught and get basically brought up and, and strangled if they are wearing a collar. Um, or, you know, crushed if they're wearing a harness. And it's it's very, very um, distressing to owners and, and can lead to very significant injury um, and sometimes even death. So it is something that we see in through the ER in New York. Um, and again, is a preventable problem. So um, you want to keep the door open until your dog is fully inside the elevator car. I think it's best that like people go first in the elevator car, holding the door open for their pet, not having their pet go in first. They don't know how to open the door for you. Um, and don't let your pets drag a leash drag behind. I think, you know, as soon as you get into your building, remove the leash so that um, there's, you know, nothing able to get caught within the doors of, of the escalator. Um, I'm just, this is a quick slide on a revolving door injury. Again, New York tons of revolving doors. And again, I don't know why people think that their dog understands what a revolving door is or realizes that, you know, that they should go through a revolving door like a person. They shouldn't. It can result in pretty significant injury the same way their body can get caught um, with, uh, you know, as the door turns and result in crush injury, fractures, or head trauma. Um, this image right here is a CT image of a nine month old dog that had a fractured cervical vertebrae from a revolving door injury with that little blue circle right there. You know, it it, it can result in, in, in devastating injury. So um, don't allow your pets to go into a revolving door, hold them. If you must go through a revolving door, hold them in your hand. Or obviously the best thing to do is just use an alternate entry point. Okay, dog park etiquette. So dog parks, there are so many dog parks in, in New York. It's a great benefit of living in New York. There are 145 dog parks in New York City in 2019, and this is growing, so I'm sure there's more now. Benefits of the dog park are many. It includes socialization. It helps you get outside. It helps your pet exercise. Um, but with all of those benefits come risks. So there's risks of dog bites, injury, and spread of infectious disease, like respiratory disease, which is very common in dogs, uh, GI parasites, viral and bacterial diseases, leptospirosis, which we'll talk about, um, and more. So, you know, how to be a good dog park citizen. There are many ways to do that. Make sure your dog is dog park ready. I think a lot of people get a puppy and they think, oh my God, I have a puppy. I can't wait to go to the dog park. Let me bring them there immediately. But really no puppies should be in the dog park. And ideally no dogs under eight months old should are ready for the dog park. We want dogs in the dog park to have a positive experience. And if you expose them when they're too young, um, they can have a real negative experience in the dog park and that can stick with them. And it's not a controllable thing 
for you guys in the dog park. So, um, you know, if you have a puppy, it's really important to spend time training and socializing them, but it shouldn't be in the dog park until they're ready. If you have an aggressive dog, of course, they should not be in the dog park, but I think some people think that their dog is not as aggressive as they are and come anyway. If you see an aggressive dog at the dog park, I, I, just, I would just leave um, to prevent your dog from, from getting into an altercation with them. Make sure your dog is spayed or neutered. Um, this prevents unwanted pregnancy, unwanted mounting behavior, which can lead to aggression. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the times these dogs can be overly ag aggressive. And I don't mean aggressive mean, but more just socially aggressive. And of course, you only want to bring vaccinated pets to the dog park. Um, vaccines help prevent the spread of infectious disease, some of which can be fatal. I can't tell you how many dogs I've seen with very significant um, preventable fatal infectious disease that come in very, very sick, like parvovirus or distemper. Um, so make sure that your pet is vaccinated prior to bringing them to the dog park and don't bring them if they're not vaccinated. This seems obvious, but don't bring your dog to the dog park if they are ill, if they're sick. It's like the same as sending your sick child to school. Um, you don't want to do that to prevent spread of disease and the same thing when it comes to dogs. It really puts other animals at risk as well as worsening illness in your own pet. You want to bring water um, and a bowl to avoid dehydration. Um, this also helps prevent the spread of disease since um, shared water bowls can spread disease. So if you bring your own water bowl, that would be best. They make those collapsible water bowls. Everyone should have one. And it also prevents um, dehydration, but it, in the worst case, it can prevent heat stroke, which is something that we see um, in the warmer months when animals are playing at the dog park. Make sure to go to the dog park that is appropriate for your dog's size. I don't know why people bring their small dog into the larger dog park and vice versa. There are rules that are set for a reason and um, it can result in significant injury, sometimes even death to, to these animals when you bring them into the wrong side of the dog park. And don't bring toys to the dog park, which can lead to negative interactions. It's, it's really breeds um, aggression between dogs. If you bring like a, a toy, my dog once got into a really bad altercation with the dog at the dog park because their owner brought in a, a toy. And of course my dog wanted the toy. And then um, my dog got into a, a fight with another dog because of that. So no toys at the dog park. And then of course, pay attention to your dog. Don't pay attention to your phone at the dog park. You want to be very close to your pet. Don't allow them far away from you um, in case you need to intervene when there's some sort of like scuffle with another dog. You want to be near them. Okay. Marijuana ingestion. So um, I've seen countless animals that come in after ingesting marijuana or THC products. Um, this is so, so common these days, especially now that marijuana is um, legal in New York. We see it every single day at the Animal Medical Center. Um, the marijuana plant contains more than 400 chemicals, but THC is the major psychoactive constituent. It's the most commonly used illicit drug in the United States. Not really illicit anymore, but um, in animals, the most common source of exposure is by ingestion. So they have to eat it in order to become significantly affected. Animals typically will not show signs with secondhand smoke inhalation um, related to THC toxicity. A lot of the times they can develop respiratory signs from the smoke but, and then it can exacerbate underlying respiratory disease. But as far as like coming in with signs of THC toxicity from inhaled smoke, really, 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 really rare. It's really the animals that eat the marijuana that come in with signs. Um, the minimum lethal oral dose in dogs for THC is greater than three grams per K, which is really high. Um, so that means that this drug has really high safety margin, which is good. And, um, you know, death is really rarely seen in these cases, but um, can, is typically seen more in um, animals that ingest very concentrated medical grade forms of THC. And that usually happens with animals that are um, eating edibles or like vape oil cartridges because it's really concentrated THC. What are the things that we look out for in, in the ER? Again, it's like very typical. These animals present all very similarly. They come in, they can be depressed, hypersalvation, like drooling, mydriasis, which is when they have um, dilated pupils, 
they're often hyper aesthetic. Okay. And what that means is that they react very um, abnormally to normal touch. So you go to pet your dog and they are like, whoa, whoa, like, what is that? That, you know, almost acting like petting them in a normal way would hurt them. Um, you approach them and they uh, back up or, you know, sort of jerk away from you. Sometimes they can vomit, although that's not super common. Um, they are often ataxic or uncoordinated in all four of their limbs. They often are dribbling urine. They can tremor, um, but they're very commonly hypothermic. Their temperature will be a little bit low and they're bradycardic, meaning that their heart rate is low. So uh, when we, your dog comes in to the emergency room, in most cases, we expect their heart rate to be a little fast, right? They're coming into an environment in which they don't know. They are people approaching them and examining them who they don't know. But in these cases, um, their heart rate is actually sort of low. And for being in the emergency room, you'd expect their heart rate to, to be high or normal and their heart rate's actually low. So all of these things together usually indicate some sort of marijuana ingestion and um, we can tell. So how do we diagnose this problem? Diagnosis is usually based on history. So exposure to marijuana um, and in conjunction with the animal's clinical picture. So we tip, when I see a dog, and I can even look at it from across the room and not even put hands on it. I can typically tell that their animal is high. It, they all look very similar. Our nurses can tell at triage. They'll come back and be like, that dog's high. Um, so again, like these dogs come in all looking very much the same, just different degrees of severity. It's super, super helpful when people tell us that their dog may have been exposed to marijuana. And I, I can't stress that enough. Um, we don't care. We're not going to get you in trouble please just tell us, like, we're going to ask you, first of all, we're absolutely going to ask you. And I, I'm not shy about that. But if you just come in and be like, I think my dog ate pot, there was pot and I, I was there and it's not there. Um, that's really helpful because it sort of allows us to dictate very specific treatment and not waste, um, you know, money and time and on all these diagnostics, working up things that it could be instead of just focusing on what it is. Um, sometimes people will use over-the-counter drug kits, but the, the results on these kits are very variable and are often unreliable. So we don't typically test urine uh, for marijuana because a negative result doesn't mean anything to me. False negatives are super, super common. And there's lots of interference of a large number of metabolites in canine urine. So again, um, really unreliable with these drug tests. These drug tests, however, are very reliable for other uh, drug ingestion. So like cocaine, barbiturates, um, benzodiazepine, all of these other medications, drugs, whatever your animal could have gotten into, the drug kits are actually very good for that. They're not very good for marijuana ingestion. How do we treat these cases? Uh, treatment is highly supportive in nature. A lot of the times it's um, fluid therapy and time and a lot of monitoring and anti-nausea medications because we don't want your animal vomiting if they are um, neurologically impaired, which a lot of these guys are. In certain cases um, with moderate or severely infected animals, we will use this um, very specific medication called intralipid that we have at the AMC. Um, and it really helps uh, with these cases, but we don't use it in mild cases. Um, we use it in the cases that are more severely affected because it comes with its own risks. Prognosis is usually excellent with treatment. These animals do really well. Um, sometimes we'll even send you home without um, recommending admission, but um, it can be guarded with, with edibles. So if your animal eats really that really concentrated THC, um, sometimes those cases, they're not um, as simple and they don't do well and they can die or develop other complications secondary to neurologic impairment. Okay, lepto. So um, I think a lot of you have probably heard of leptospirosis, uh, especially because it's a zoonotic disease. So it's something that people can actually get. It is an infectious bacterial disease. It's spread through the urine of reservoir hosts. So in New York City, um, it is a common infectious disease we see in, in dogs due to the the reservoir hosts and in New York, it is the rodent population and there's tons and tons of, of rodents in, in New York, unfortunately. They um, indirect spread to our dogs via stagnant water, so puddles, uh, but can also be with direct content, contact of rodent urine. 
dogs don't necessarily need to drink from a pedal to get lepto. And in New York, uh, rats and mice live inside. They live in our homes with us, a lot of the cases. So indoor dogs can also be exposed. I can't tell you how many people are like, my dog doesn't even go outside. Doesn't matter. Your dog can still get lepto because there are rodents in your home. <laughs> hate to break it to you. <laughs> rodents in your home. Um, lepto is also really hardy in the environment. It can last in soil uh, for months. So um, what are the clinical signs of lepto? Animals can get quite sick. Um, vomiting, diarrhea, they can become PUPD. That means polyuric, polydipsic, meaning they pee and they drink a lot. They can have muscle pain, develop inappetence, like profound lethargy. And in severe cases, they can develop jaundice or, or icterus. So you actually look at their skin, their eyes, their gums, and uh, they appear yellow. They can sometimes have a fever. The severity of these signs really can really vary very greatly depending on how severely your animal is affected. We see that younger dogs actually do look worse clinically. Um, this bacteria really likes to infect the kidneys and the liver. They can cause a severe acute, what's called acute kidney injury or kidney failure um, and liver injury. You can have an AKI acute kidney injury without liver involvement or much less commonly the reverse, but most cases we'll see both um, both body systems are affected. What is the treatment? Um, again, it really varies with severity. I think, you know, me being a ER doctor, ICU doctor in a tertiary referral hospital, I see animals that come in very sick. So those are the ones I'm used to seeing, but a lot of vets, a lot of animals will present initially to their general practitioner um, and be treated if they're very mildly affected, can be treated with antibiotics as an outpatient. When they come and see me, they're usually very sick. So um, again, the ones that I see require hospitalization. Oftentimes these cases are hospitalized for a week or even more cases. Um, we treat them with antibiotics, obviously. It's a bacterial disease. Um, a lot of supportive care, really intense and very um, specific fluid therapy. Their fluid needs are very variable depending on what state of the disease that they're in. Urine output monitoring, and and in some very severe cases, these animals require dialysis. Their kidneys are so affected that they actually stop working and they stop producing urine. And then those are the cases that require um, dialysis for a period of time um, until their kidney function we can get it back. So um, these cases can be very expensive, as you can imagine. They typically cost. They require dialysis, um, like over twenty five thousand dollars at our hospital. It's very it's expensive. The prognosis um, depends on the disease severity. Um, so I usually tell people it's fair to guarded in severe cases, but in mild cases, it can be quite good if it's caught super early. But when an animal starts to become oliguric or anuric, meaning their urine production starts to drop off or even stop, then the prognosis worsens um, and those animals can, they can do okay with care and with dialysis, but um, they can also develop pretty significant complications um, of the disease and uh, not survive. This is also something that we can do a lot to prevent our animals from, from getting. Um, so the most important thing, if you take away anything about lepto is to vaccinate your pet for leptospirosis. It's not a vaccine, you know, no vaccine really, but the vaccine isn't a hundred percent protective, but it really, really helps, um, prevent many, many, many diseases and also the severity of disease as well. Um, so if your animal gets lepto and it's vaccinated, they'll do better than dogs that are not vaccinated and get lepto. So lepto um, in New York and around, I guess it's not technically a core vaccine, um, but in New York City, it really should be considered a, a core vaccine. Every dog in New York City, even small indoor dogs um, should get a lepto vaccine. It's a yearly vaccine. Um, most general practitioners in the New York area will insist on your dog getting it. If your vet doesn't, for some reason, make sure to mention it to them and say that you want it. Um, and, you know, it really, really helps, again, uh, prevent the spread of this disease and prevents your animal from getting this disease. Another thing we can do is try to control the rat and mouse population. You want to clean the environment, um, avoid puddles and avoid stagnant water, et cetera. Okay. Quick slide on pavement injury. Very urban problem. Um, they, 
air temperature outside can be significantly less than pavement temperature. The pavement can be up to 60 degrees hotter than the air temperature. This is a nice little chart um, showing that. It's actually crazy, the difference between the air temperature and the pavement temperature. Um, this can be influenced by surface material, cloud coverage, humidity, and time of day, like all of all of these things, but a good way to test it, like, is it safe to walk my dog on pavement, is to hold the back of your hand to the pavement. And if you can do that for more than seven seconds, then your dog can go and take his walk. But if it's super hot and you have to take your hand away before seven seconds, um, you should do some things to prevent injury uh, to your dogs walking on that day. So you can try to schedule their walks early in the day or later in the evening where the um, temperature of the pavement will be less hot. You can put booties on your dog if they will tolerate it. You can also use paw wax. I really like this one because some dogs hate things on their feet. My dog hated things on his feet, um, but paw wax, he would tolerate. There's tons of different, different ones um, available online. And it just also moisturizes your pet's paws. So it has other benefits as well, but it prevents um, your, the paw pad from directly touching the pavement, gives a little bit of a buffer. And you can walk your dog on grass if possible in New York. There's not that much grass. Uh, but if you live other, <laughs> other places, there probably is. Uh, what you can do is, you know, if you think that your dog may have injured their paws, you know, take a look. Check your dog's pads daily. Monitor your dog for lameness, so limping, licking at their paws, or any color change to the pads. You can also, and should be, aside from just pavement injury due to, like, heat, there's things all over the pavement in New York. So people break glass on the floor. There are things your animal can eat off the, the floor. You know, just be really mindful of when you're walking your pet, what is out there and what is, you know, look down for a little bit and see, and just try to avoid any uh, broken glass so that we don't see a dog that comes in with glass in his foot, which is something we, we do see um, fairly commonly. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about rodenticide. Again, those, those that New York City rodent population causing problems for our pets. So um, rodenticide, there are three main types of rodenticide, although there are many more, but I'm just gonna talk about the three ones that we see most commonly in the emergency room. One is an anticoagulant rodenticide, one is a cholecalciferol rodenticide, and the other one is called bromethylene. This is a really, really common toxicity in New York City due to the rodent population. People have this stuff out everywhere. And the signs and treatment will depend on the type of rodenticide. So I'm going to go through each one of those. I think before we start, the biggest takeaway here is to know, if you can, which type of rodenticide your pet ate or may have eaten. Um, so if you can bring in the packaging, if you have it at home, like so helpful for us, again, it helps us really streamline um, diagnostics and treatment instead of trying to do, you know, we'd have to do all of these tests. Um, if you're unsure, if you live in a building and you don't know what your landlord uses, just give them a call. Sometimes we'll get the answer um, from them. It's super, super helpful to us. I'm going to first talk about anticoagulant rodenticide. This is the most common one. I think that we see in the ER. It comes in a variety of formulations. Um, it looks typically like this blue, chunky stuff, although it, it can not be green, although it mostly is. Um, the way that this rodenticide works is that it interrupts vitamin K1 production in the liver. Vitamin K is crucial to the production of clotting factors, two, seven, nine, and 10. So your liver makes these clotting factors and it needs vitamin K to do so. This Anticoagulant works by blocking vitamin K. So then your liver doesn't have vitamin K to make these clotting factors. It leads to prolongation of clotting factors in two to three days after ingestion. So if your dog eats anticoagulant rodenticide today, it will be normal, normal for two to three days until those clotting factors in your dog's blood that it has already produced run out. So your dog is producing these clotting, you are everyone producing these clotting factors all the time in the liver. And when it eats this rodenticide, it stops production of, it interrupts vitamin K1 production, but your body still has clotting factors already because it's been making them all the time. And it takes two to three days for these clotting factors to run out. And that's when your dog comes in with actual clinical signs of bleeding. So what do you see at home? Um, pale gums, lethargy, blood in their urine. Uh, 
Sometimes they'll come in with difficulty breathing because these dogs tend to bleed into their cavity, so into their uh, thoracic cavity most often. Bloody or black uh, stool, hematemesis, which is vomiting blood. How do we how do we treat this problem? Um, if you think your pet ingested any rodenticide, um, decontamination is key. I can't stress that enough. So bring them in. Do not wait. Please come. We'd love to see you. Um, we can induce vomiting within hours of ingestion. It's usually really fruitful in these cases. We then will administer activated charcoal, which is an oral medication that helps bind residual toxins in their GI tract. Also great for this problem. We then will recommend if we can come in and we can do some sort of decontamination with your pet, we will then recommend returning to us in two to three days so that we can check um, their PT or prothrombin time. And that allows us to monitor if there is any prolongation in, in this value. If this value is prolonged, we will start vitamin K therapy, which is basically like the antidote for this problem. We replace the vitamin K that your dog's body cannot make for about a month. Um, and these cases do very well. Um, if we catch it early when the their PT or prothrombin is prolonged. Please, when we tell you to come back for this blood test, please come back. We're telling you for a reason. Um, it's a test that we can do in-house at the Animal Medical Center. We get the results back in 10 minutes. Um, it's not typically something most general practitioners have in-house. Some do, um, but we have it available all the time. So if we ask you to come back in two to three days, please do that so that we can make sure that your dog is safe to go on. If the prothrombin time is normal, we will send your dog home and the risk is, is none. It will be fine if your, pro, if your PT is normal, which is great. That means your dog, we decontaminate them effectively or they didn't eat enough to cause an actual problem or they didn't eat it at all, which is also common. Um, if an animal comes in actively bleeding, we will recommend admission to the hospital. These animals typically require oxygen therapy. They often will require blood and plasma transfusions to replace the clotting factors that aren't being made. Um, and then we obviously start vitamin K in the hospital as well. Even in those cases that come in super sick, um, the prognosis is still very good. We at the AMC, I think, are really able to recognize this problem very quickly. Again, New York, it's a real New York problem um, because of the rodent population. We know if an animal is bleeding secondary to rodenticide very quickly within a very short period of time of your visit. So um, because of that, we're able to treat them really aggressively. And oftentimes these dogs do quite well. Okay, cholecalciferol uh, rodenticide is um, a, a, an overdose of vitamin D3. It works by increases increasing calcium and phosphorus absorption in the GI tract, increasing absorption in the kidneys, and it actually mobilizes calcium from bone. And this results in really, really high um, blood calcium concentrations, typically within 12 to 48 hours after ingestion. Um, this also would apply to if your dog ate a bunch of vitamin D3. Like if you have vitamin D3 at home and your dog got into those actual vitamins, it's the same mechanism of action as this cholecalciferol rodenticide. Signs that you may notice at home, inappetence, vomiting, again, polyuria, polydipsia, lethargy, um, and signs of acute kidney injury, which are basically just those. The treatment is decontamination. Again, if you think your animal got into any sort of thing, please just bring them in so that if it needs decontamination, we can, we can do that. We typically will induce vomiting followed by activated charcoal, just like the anticoagulant rodenticide. And then in this case, it's a little different because we're looking for different things um, in your pet's blood and it causes injury to the kidney due to high calcium in the blood, uh, not bleeding. So we're monitoring uh, your pet's calcium and their kidney values over 48 hours. If your animal comes in with already with a kidney with kidney injury due to rodenticide in, ingestion, we will recommend hospitalization for fluid therapy, uh, gastroprotective medications, and we will um, put them on phosphate binders to bring down their uh, phosphate in their blood, as well as calcium secreting medications like Lasix and um, bisphosphonates. So very specific treatment. It's very different than an anti coagulant rodenticide. I get, that's why it's so important for us to know what type of rodenticide uh, your pet 
ingests. And the prognosis can be very variable with this. If we catch it early enough, the prognosis is very good. If we catch it when kidney injury has already occurred, um, the prognosis can be variable and your animal can leave with chronic kidney disease from this acute injury. Bromethylene is the last type of rodenticide I'm going to touch on. This is completely different than the other two and is a neurotoxin that causes cerebral edema, so swelling of the central nervous system. The clinical signs are very dose dependent. Um, high dose, doses can cause a convulsive syndrome. Um, and this is just like seizures essentially. And these patients typically show signs rather quickly, um, can show signs within a couple hours of ingestion, up to 36 hours, but usually pretty quickly. Or um, if they ingest low doses, it results in a completely different uh, set of clinical signs called paralytic syndrome, where they're very ataxic or uncoordinated, they can develop muscle tremors and weakness. And these cases can actually take up to a week to develop signs, which is interesting. So really high doses, they'll develop signs really quickly, lower doses, they'll develop signs um, sometimes days and days later. Treatment, again, Again, here we are, decontamination is key, vomiting, activated charcoal, and then we treat the signs once they develop. So if they start seizuring, we'll put them on anticonvulsant therapy, give them mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic to help decrease swelling in their central nervous system, fluids, methocarbamol, which helps with muscle tremors. Um, unfortunately, the prognosis for high dose ingestion of bromethylene is, is quite poor. Once your animal starts developing convulsives, syndrome, like the seizures, they often will not, will not survive. Dogs with paralytic syndrome, those milder signs have a very fair to good prognosis um, with treatment, but the ones that come in seizuring secondary to bromethylene, unfortunately don't do very well. Okay. Last, last thing, um, blue green algae. So, um, I put this on here because I think people ask about it and it is something that we can see mostly in the lakes of central park. Um, this type of algae can produce cyanobacteria and this cyanobacteria actually can produce two types of dangerous toxins, mycostatin and anatoxin. The, this type of bacteria can be found in lakes, rivers, and ponds. Um, and it's usually, it's not every lake with that has, that has algae has this problem. Typically you'll see what's called like algae blooms in, in the water. So this will often indicate an overgrowth of cyanobacteria. It's something we see typically after warm weather or when it doesn't rain. And um, the lake can appear blue green, like the name suggests, or actually can appear brown red. So you can see the difference between these pictures. They both have cyanobacteria um, in it and they look very different. If you notice mats on the top of the lake, foam or uh, scum, or oftentimes it'll have a really bad odor. The signs of blue-green algae toxicity um, depend on the specific toxin in the water, but the most common ones, the my mycostatin and the anatoxin affect the nervous system or the liver. Signs typically are seen very quickly within hours of ingestion. Um, people notice vomiting, diarrhea, inappetence, weakness, collapse, tremors, ataxia, seizures. Their dog was normal. It went for a swim. Then it is very, very abnormal. Treatment um, is often supportive in nature. There is no anecdote for this problem. So we just treat the animal's clinical signs. We put them on liver supportive medications, et cetera. Um, you can bathe the dog if you think that your dog was exposed. That's really something that you can do at home. Uh, activated charcoal is not effective uh, for this toxin. And again, prevention is key. Don't have your dog swim in any body of water with obvious blooms. If there's any sort of like green surface to the lake, don't go swimming. It seems pretty obvious, but I, I think people with their dogs are a little bit more lax when it comes to these things. You want to mind local signage. So um, the Central Park's really good about putting up signs when animals shouldn't be swimming in the lakes. Uh, please keep an eye out for those and believe them when they're up. And then if you're unsure, if your animal can uh, swim, you can always call the, I, I assume you can probably call 311. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but I would try 311, but um, you can also find a park ranger and just ask them. If your dog develops signs of blue-green algae toxicity, unfortunately, these cases don't, don't do very well. Their prognosis is guarded to poor if signs develop. So it's really something that can, you know, go from just a nice swim to very severe um, hospitalization, even death in these cases. And again, it's super preventable. So 
and something we see in our backyard that is an actual picture of New York with blue green algae in the lake. So, um, you know, just be mindful of it if your dog is a swimmer. Woo, okay. <laughs> All right, I've finished. Um, great. <laughs> <laughs> amazing okay I <laughs> talked a lot that um, was terrific yeah um or if you want to unshare um okay. we can take some questions we have a few thank you so much yeah no, there's no a, obviously a lot of things that happen and we see them you guys see them all in the ER like often on the same day right so um yeah there's a lot um okay we have a few questions just first um about leptospirosis can it affect cats if so can they be vaccinated? So technically the answer is, is yes, but clinically no. So they can get lepto, but they're typically not clinical for it. So there are no vaccines for cats um, and there's no reason to vaccinate them. They are fine. Um, but the answer technically is yes, but really the answer is, is no, if that makes any sense. Like it, it shouldn't affect them clinically. Okay. And, and it can affect people though, right? And it, but it can affect people. Yeah. So if your dog has lepto, um, you want to make sure that you're not handling their urine. Um, typically when you start antibiotic therapy, they are um, not spreading the disease like, like, you know, pretty soon after starting antibiotic therapy. But um, a lot of the times they'll, you know, urinate if you have a backyard or around your house, you know, they'll be, a lot of the times they'll, they're polyuric. So they sometimes have accidents in the house before you start treatment. And those can be infectious to you and also to if you have a do another dog in the house and i i've seen unfortunately multi-dog households come in with very significant lepto in the same just because of the infectious nature of it which is terrible obviously yes okay yeah definitely um okay we have a question about blood on the street human um human and dog poop is that dangerous to our dogs no it's just gross <laughs> yeah no, what it's about not really dog? dangerous. I mean, it can cause like GI upset. Um, I guess with, with dogs, they can get um, GI parasites from other dogs' uh, stool. And they can, they can spread like infectious gastrointestinal disease. Like um, just like kids get stomach viruses, dogs can get stomach virus too. And the way that they spread is through interaction um, on the street a lot of the time or at daycare. So like Yes, they can get sick. Is it usually a big deal? Not really. Um, I would try to, I try to, if your dog wants to sniff another dog's poop on the street, I usually try to try to avoid it. It's, it's gross and it can lead to disease, but it's usually very mild and manageable. And on that note, we did have a question and speaking of gross, but dogs eating fecal matter. So that's yeah, it's gross. Yeah, not, it's it's gross. dangerous. Yeah. Cat, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Are stray cats at risk if they're regular food or mice rats that eat rodenticide from those plastic containers? Yeah. And can a dog, we, we had that before, um, even dogs picking up and eating rats. Like, can so they yeah, that's a that? great question. Um, yeah. Usually the answer is no. If there is a rodent that has is died secondary to rodenticide ingestion and your animal eats that rodent, there is not like a second pass toxicity to your pet. I think it like from what they'd have to eat tons and tons. Yeah. Of like, them, right? like a lot of like them. A, yeah. So yeah. It, it's usually nothing to worry about. Um, okay. Wait, let's see. Um, I'm a motorized wheelchair user. Sadly, the bike lane can be a good place for uh, for me, does bright, do bright jackets work for the dog? I really need to decide where to ride on. Oh, sidewalk. Yeah, yeah, totally. For sure. Like same for us when, you know, when you're outside in the dark, when you're, if you're a runner, having some sort of reflective gear is important for your safety. Same for dogs. Absolutely. And I think they probably make, um, I've seen a bunch of dogs wearing them. I think they probably make tons of them that you can get online. So if you can do that and your dog will tolerate it for sure. Okay, great. Um, can pets get poisoned by pesticides? sprayed around plants that are, and used on lawns if they lick their paws? That's a really good question. And the answer is most of the time, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It has to be it's super, like the amount. Yeah. super concentrated. Um, and a, a lot of people come in thinking that their animal is poisoned secondary to an aerosolized spray. Really, really unlikely. Really, okay. really, really unlikely. Yeah. Okay. We have a question about, yeah. Um, do you recommend that cats do not go outside? And I recommend yes, to yes. Not go especially Very in the strongly. city. Yeah, <laughs> anywhere, but yeah. Um, is rabies common in New York City? 
No, rabies is really mm -hmm. uncommon Maybe. in New York City. Uh, the last dog case of rabies was in like the 50s, something like that, really, really long time ago, over 70 or something like that. So um, super, super uncommon when it comes to our domestic pet population, although it is something that um, can be seen in wild animals. So like raccoons are a big reservoir for rabies in New York State. Um, squirrels do not carry rabies. Um, they... So that's, I think a lot of people get worried when their dog gets bit by a squirrel. They don't carry rabies in New York. It's, I think, um, hasn't been reported. I don't, I don't know what about them doesn't allow them to carry rabies, but they, do, they don't. Um, so that's, I think a good thing to know about okay. people are often concerned about it, but raccoons definitely do. And cats, because they are outside wild animals are more likely to have rabies than, um, Dogs, dogs are, we don't typically see a bunch of stray dogs outside in New York. Okay, now, now we want to clarify because someone says, why do you recommend cats not go outside, particularly if they're leash and harness trained? Well, that's different, right? They yeah, if, I, yeah, yeah, like I mentioned yeah. before, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't think that your cat should be allowed to let Running out and come back. Um, but if your cat is harness trained, and again, like you have to put in a lot of work for that to be a good idea, but that's okay. If your cat is truly harness trained and does well with it, they can go outside. But I just don't want your cat leaving and coming back as they please. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think from what I see, cats don't necessarily walk on a leash the way your dog does, right? No. It's like they kind of do meander yeah. into their thing. They don't, um, they don't like love it. I mean, um, some cats some are weird, right? Some cats are like dogs. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I see people have rabbits on the street too. So, yeah. Some people um, have, I think rab everything. rabbits are a little bit more easier to control, but also Correct. rabbits are similar to cats in that they're very fast yeah, um, and they're very uh, bendy. So yeah. you have to get a very specific type of harness to safely bring them outside. Okay, good. Um, all right. How about ticks in Central Park? I got one on me while laying with my dog. Yeah. It's unclear it, if it was a, a deer tick. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Prevention. Ticks exist right? in Central Park. Um, and that is why we recommend tick prevention all year round for your pets. So um, they don't just exist in Connecticut, they exist here too. Okay. Sure. Um, what about fentanyl poisoning? Have you, uh, yeah, started, yes. she started carrying Narcan to save my dog, but I'm not sure how we know, you know, uh, or human waste containing. Yeah. It's fentanyl. impossible. Honestly, like, I think it's impossible for you to know that on the street, like as a lay person on the street, if your pet was to get in for it, it is something that we can test for with that test that I described before. It's really accurate for um, fentanyl. So we could actually test for it. And we, we have Narcan, um, at AMC and we can, um, administer it. I think ingestion of fentanyl is not super common in our pets, luckily, thankfully. Um, but it's something that I've seen before. The case that I can think of is when a, a dog actually ingested a fentanyl patch, mm -hmm. um, that we, Ad administer as as veterinarians and sometimes people have them at home so it was an accidental ingestion of an owner's fentanyl patch um and it came in completely uh recumbent because it had ingested the fentanyl patch and i found the fentanyl patch in the back of the dog's throat oh, so my. but it made a full recovery because i well, that it gave me it told me what was wrong yeah. um but it made a full recovery because we gave it naloxone or narcan and it did very well um but I think it would be really hard for you to tell that on the street, but if your dog is normal, 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 very acutely abnormal, like recumbent, essentially, just pick them up and run to the, the nearest place. And even that, just again, as you said before, but just to uh, reiterate, just be on it, be forthcoming. It, it'll just oh, make all yes, the difference. Please. And, and yeah. someone, we had a question about, you know, will you get in, I think unless it's in a like abuse issue, right? Like you're not going to report it. No, to the I would never. Yeah. For, yeah. No, yeah. I would never. Yeah. Um, it's so much more important for us to treat your pet appropriately. Mm -hmm. And you being a pet owner just want your pet to be better. So that's what we are focused on. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. There was a, back to uh, a question about paw wax. Um, and then I know we're over, but so we'll, we'll wrap up soon. But um, here in Florida, um, it's over 90 uh, is using paw wax. Okay. Or will it, you know, cook <laughs> because no, of the heat? It, no, it works. It like creates a barrier essentially. Um, and again, helps like, like, 
keep your pet paw pads moist. Um, so it like provides all different things. It's also something to use. I mean, not in Florida, but like in the snow, it's really helpful mm -hmm. to prevent the, um, your paw from getting, uh, like those snow fuzzies in it. Um, but it's, it's a great product and I would try, definitely try it. You know, a booty is better, obviously like a booty is like full protection, but I think it's a great alternative. And my dog would never wear, but I tried every oh, brand. A lot everything. of dogs, my dog would yeah. never wear. Booty. Never, some never. dogs are, again, it's all about training. So and I didn't have him as a, yeah, when he was young. So yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And then this is a good one on, on that note, um, because dogs regulate their temp by sweating through their paws, does do booties or paw wax affect that? Um, I mean, they just probably just sweat into the booty. Um, and they dogs just don't, although they, they mostly regulate their temperature through panting, although they do regulate some of their temperature through sweating. And that is in their paws. It is such a small percentage that it's not going to affect their ability to regulate their temperature. They regulate their temperature again through, through panting. Um, so if you had a dog on like a really, really hot day and you put a full muzzle on them and they couldn't pant, that would be a problem. But putting booties on your animal won't be a problem. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. We have many people saying thank you and great presentation. Um, we will send out a link tomorrow to everyone if you'd like to watch it again or share it. Um, Dr. Fox, thank you so much for this. And also just thank you for always being there for us. If we have any questions or, um, you know, you also, um, she does vet camp with us and you're just, you know, just, we appreciate your support all the time. And thank you. You're you. amazing. You so great. So, and, and um, thank you to Kimberly um, Young for helping to um, coordinate tonight. I'm sorry, everyone, that we had that weird technical glitch earlier, but we hopefully we, we recovered and um, went forward. So thank you all again for, um, you know, sh sharing part of your evening with us. Um, and again, we'll send out the link tomorrow and we will see you next time. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you.